You're here with Plutocracy Now. This is Joey Hornbuckle. I'm Taz Rickland. Bridgman Bolger. Scott and Brown! <laughs> Scott Brown is in the house. Okay. So today we're going to talk about Plutocracy. And I don't know if you guys have been following much on the immigration reform lately, but the, it's the Gang of Eight in the Senate. It's eight senators who are negotiating over a, an immigration reform that would include steps to citizenship and would also include a guest worker program but the guest worker program is controversial because you don't want to bring in too many new people because then you depress wages and you don't want to bring in too few people because you're denying people opportunity and you do need low-skilled workers for low-skilled jobs so you would think that the senators the people that we elected would be negotiating with each other on this but it's not it's been the AFL-CIO and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that negotiated and came up with a deal on what the guest worker program should look like. And then they put it on the desk for the Gang of Eight and said, here you go, here's what the deal's going to be. Now this is one of, this is probably going to be the biggest reform, if it happens, the biggest reform of 2013. That's a really strange alliance. What, Joey, I don't know anything about this, so what No, so, so what they're not, they're on? not allied. The, the, the well, labor union wants uh, fewer workers and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants more workers, right? So they both want a different thing. Oh, so they compromise but with then each they, other? They, they are the ones that came up with a compromise. Not oh. our senators, but the special interest groups. And why is that surprising? <laughs> why is it surprising that the most powerful interest groups would play their hand and create legislation? It is disappointing because it's not government by the experts. It's not government by popular will. It's government, it government by special by interests. Special yeah. interests. <laughs> government by cash So they money. basically wrote the bill and it gave it to they, they, their paid politicians. It was like, here, here's the bill. Sign it. And this, this, is, <laughs> this is well known. This is well known. But the media is not pointing it out. Like they're saying it, but then they're not saying, you oh, know yeah, why the media is pointing it out? Because they're part of the plutocracy as well. The media lobby and is see, a big this one. Is, are, this, the AFL CIO, labor unions, and and, who else, and the Chamber of Commerce. All right, these are basically the two sides that, that developed our modern plutocracy. Uh, it's, it basically started like the late 70s. This is when the same time when income inequality just started exploding in this country. And like ever since, dude, it's just Reagan been revolution more and more. And no, even before that, though, even before that, it was like late like 79. See, unions, unions were at like their peak of their power, the late 70s. And then that was that was when the corporations basically took their playbook of how they were having so much influence on our government by organizing all these I mean, basically, AstroTurf campaigns was what they would do. They'd basically just have people mass mail their all, all the stuff you're Tez. you're always saying to do. Mail your dude. They'd get people to mail their representatives like in mass. They'd have protests and they'd bring all the materials. Same stuff they still do. Unions did that for a while, and then late seventies, corporations come in, see what they're doing, take their playbook. The Chamber of Commerce is one of them that was definitely in on it from the beginning and so now these two are working they're, they're together and they're the most two... successful example right the u.s chamber of commerce they're they're the yeah. biggest ones when it comes to a, a huge corporate business lobby group they've really yeah definitely i mean they just look out for business in general and, and, and the afl cio I, mean, I know it's a labor union but is it I, i've heard i actually don't know a whole lot about it i mean is it lawyer related i've heard like a lot of no it's not about lawyer it. it's, it's no it's, it's just it's a specific. really big it's it's I, I don't know exactly what it is what's special about that labor union compared i know it's one of the biggest ones i, I, don't I think know. it is the biggest but i i just wondered if there was something that the american federation it. of labor and congress of industrial organizations so yeah it's it's, it's so it's basically the big umbrella group basically yeah for labor unions what the u.s chamber of commerce is for businesses basically basically right. so you guys have kind of set up a situation where in the 1970s something changed and that's when plutocracy kind of started our modern plutocracy but i want to take it back to the no. founding it, it, it always it always <laughs> exists to <laughs> a degree <laughs> it always exists nah. right? so you know i'm gonna say something right now yeah. democracy and plutocracy are always battling each other and like it basically that's how it's always There's been. The wealth never, has always been really kind of ever since. Ever since we stopped being in tribes, ever since we started developing chiefdoms, there's been, 
you know, political and wealth inequality at the same time for the most of the time. And I mean, it goes, it ebbs and flows. But dude, those are the forces that battles. Plutocracy. Uh, but there, there is something to be said about the rise and fall of plutocracy in how much power it has over the government. Uh, it's, it's generally thought, actually, generally accepted by historians, just straight out, that we were mainly a plutocratic country with a plutocratic government during the second half of the 1800s. That's just generally agreed upon. Right. So. Eventually, what happened actually around the, the era of Roosevelt was that you saw a decline in the ability for democracy to uh, have, for, for plutocracy to have control over government. And you saw a rise in technocracy, which is government by experts, and a rise of democracy, which is government by popular will. But in the 70s, this started to change. In the 70s, we saw that this, this equation really started going back towards plutocracy. Well, you started even earlier in that. If you look uh, in the beginning of the American uh, Industrial Revolution, you know, you had uh, gross improprieties with uh, worker conditions. And beginning in the early 19th century, um, it began to become an issue with child labor. And that was more of the upswing for of a more progressive labor-oriented movement in this country that was probably like the foundation and that was a piggybacked off the, of the abolitionist movement so if you look at it from a historical context and with the anti-trade that that all, all that led to the antitrust laws and that was really the beginning of a regulatory system in America because prior to that there were no checks and balances you, well, you could directly walk into a congressman office and put a, a uh, uh, two thousand dollars, two hundred thousand well, dollars on the desk. I I, I want to tell you about what I think is the biggest victory of plutocracy in American history, and that is it, this is one percent versus ninety nine percent. And I'm talking about the South before the Civil War. In the South before the Civil War, you look at the white people who live there. One percent of them, roughly, own slaves Correct. in huge plantations. The other ninety nine percent owned no slaves and were about as dirt poor as slaves because were. they couldn't have any jobs because what were they going to do all the well, jobs were taken by slaves uh yeah well that and uh, lack of financial system and a bunch of other problems a lack of education system so here's what happened with the civil war it was literally the ability of special interest and in, in rich people in the south who had the interest of continuing slavery that was able to get the entire south of the country to rebel against the North and to start an entire war over what really was just the economic interests of a very, very few people. But that's because the, plant the plantation masters were literally like feudal lords, even over the white poor class. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> if you had a job, you worked for one of them. You were an overseer or you transported slaves or you did some little... Uh, remedial job that was not trusted to the Negro. But they had a lot of power over the economy and they had a lot of power over government, especially in the South. I mean, all the way up in the 1900s, it was very well known that there was traditional power base came from a very few number of people who basically ran politics. And it's sad to say it remains the same today. <clears throat> It's it's, all, it's, it's, the mechanisms well, have not changed. As bad, but it's, the mechanisms it's, have it's, only sh they they changed. It's worse changed. in the south than in the north. I'll I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, yes, I will say that. But you know, this is the future. It's natural. <laughs> the natural process of time is progression. So you know, it is, it is better, but philosophically, it's still under. Well, no, it's see, the same thing that's going on. And, and, and talking of, talking about that, talking about the future. Like, see, I'm going to propose something right here. I'm going to propose that we're not exactly living in a plutocracy, but that we're more living in a corpocracy. And, you know, I was, I, I'd been thinking about this for a while, but then all of a sudden when the, uh, the fiscal cliff deal came through, that, that, I, that, I think that was kind of the showdown between corporate interests and the interest of the very, very rich. And, and which at the same time, I mean, they overlap for the most part, but to really see what really runs the country, it was, you know, the, the, the tax cuts for the top 2% versus, versus uh, well, it wasn't versus, it wasn't really put on the table this way, but you know what came through with it, they, they raised the taxes on the top 2%, but at the same time, how many? There was $205 billion of tax breaks for corporations. It's not going to be a fiscal cliff deal. Yeah. So you see, they're basically handed to corporations, <laughs> right. 
while while taken from rich people, and so it's it's that's right. We can't fund science, but we can give some money to NASCAR. Yeah, exactly. And it's the caterpillar. It's got to a point in our system where the markets don't even react to what goes on in Washington. Anymore. No, but what and what, <laughs> what I'm saying now, one thing that's different now, like before, our government was corrupted. People could just walk in, and lobbyists would just walk into a lobby where there'd be a safe and just throw in a bag of cash. And you know, and go tell them what they want. Go tell the politician what they want. But the difference now is how it's how, finesse. It, it, it's, it's how massive, how how technology has changed everything. How manufacturing and how we live in like a manufactured world now. Back then, there wasn't as much to to control. Now there's corporations for everything. Everything around us is made by a corporation. Everything we eat, everything we consume, like. Our daily lives like revolve around corporations, and that 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 didn't used to exist. There, I mean, there'd so, be farmers, and there'd be. So now we've got Monsanto. So you you said this is this is called cor- corptocracy. Corpocracy. Corpocracy. A government by now, the corporations for the corporations. Isn't that a version of plutocracy? Yeah, Cause, yeah. Because in I mean, plutocracy, say, yeah. when we say rule by the wealthy, well, what is wealth? It's just it's power. But I'm saying to get more specific, in, into a I, think, I think it really, I think we're really moving towards a corpocracy. And so I, that so that's a specific form of plutocracy. Because the bottom is visuals, a, you have a corporatist plutocracy, a, a, is basically a, a corporation or an organization that could be set up as a non-profit that is funded by corporations or very wealthy people who run these same corporations. So at the same, so what they do is they break their influence down into parts to make it seem like there's so much, uh, there's so, so, so many different venues are lobbying for the same thing, but when in reality, it's all the same people lobbying for the same thing. You know, they only make it appear as if that there's so many interest groups or so many corporations uh, lobbying. Well, to, they, all, they all come from different angles, too. They all come from different angles, but, at, but at they, the, they're all driven by, by the same incentives still at the end of the day. It's uh, just the bottom dollar. I mean, this is one of the things. I mean, everyone's against crony capitalism, but then one of the problems is when you got people who... who one of the problems with capitalism is, you know, where does this stop? It's capitalism is sort of our version of capitalism, our modern version of capitalism is premised on perpetual growth. But we, we don't have a, a perpetual planet. We have f- finite resources on this planet. We have we, we have a certain amount of atmosphere. We have a certain amount of oil. We have a certain amount of water. But I, I, I'm, not gonna, like, I'm not going to take the blame directly to... You can se- definitely, there's a separation between capitalism and plutocracy. Because in a no, true, I'm saying in, in, I'm, I know there's a difference, but no, nah, uh, I'm saying I'm just I'm just I'm just speaking of capitalism uh, more in general. I'm just, okay. I'm just what plutocracy does is take advantage of capitalism. And I agree. Uh, <laughs> exactly, capitalism is an even playing field, and it used to be in this country. You could come into the world dirt poor with nothing and die a billionaire, and it, it was there's several examples of this. But in our modern era, it seems like the only way that you can become phenomenally wealthy, I mean, billion, a billionaire status, is you have to have been born at least born a millionaire. Uh, <laughs> at least a millionaire. So, you know, it, <laughs> it, it's like, who is, uh, even if you're an inventor, you like, you can, you'd be like Thomas Edison, he died rich, but he had investors, yes. But nowadays, a man invents something and a corporation pays them off at a fraction of what they're like one one hundred of a percent of what they're going to make in his lifetime and he doesn't get any more revenue from it. I don't I don't think that's changed very much though I mean Thomas Edison was mainly a businessman first you know he was he was a scientist but he was really more so a businessman I mean you had scientists back then like Tesla mm. you know, Nikola Tesla died a pretty poor person and he invented I, I would say far more important and substantial groundbreaking things than uh, Edison or his entire business for that matter yeah uh, which uh, which by the way is General Electric yeah yeah, yeah General Electric but uh, it was JP Morgan bought out General Electric uh, I mean, they invested in in General Electric, but they but uh, no, General Electric's always been its own company. Yeah, yeah, it was it was Edison Electric at first. It was Edison. Uh-huh. It was Edison Electric and uh, J P Morgan. What he did behind Edison's back 
was buy up all the share shares, and he bought well he bought majority shares and basically kicked the man out of his own company. To Edison? Yeah, that's that's oh. that's that's what happened. 